Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Sana Jode, and I'm a British Academy postdoctoral fellow in the School of Geography, Politics, and Sociology. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Maria Maxu to Newcastle University this afternoon. Maria is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Copenhagen. She's an interdisciplinary scholar that works at the intersection of critical security studies, political anthropology, and practices of deterrence with a focus on NATO's Eastern Front. Currently, she's the principal investigator of ritual deterrence, which is a five-year project funded through the European Research Council's Consolidator Grant Scheme. Her talk actually is based on the work that she's currently doing on this project, which is also unfolding. But she's also the PI of the University of Copenhagen team in the Volkswagen Foundation Supported Democracy Consortium, working on a project which investigates the challenge of populist memory politics for Europe. Maria has published widely on security, identity, memory and Eastern European politics. I would simply like to highlight uh, her monograph, The Politics of Becoming European, a study of Polish and Baltic post-Cold War security imaginaries, her co-authored book on remembering Cotton, and her recent edited volume on the politics of memory. Without any doubt, her special issue on the uses of the East in international studies, which was published in the Journal of International Relations and Development, and her article on the post-colonial moment in Russia's war against Ukraine, which was published in the Journal of Genocide Research, have forced us to rethink our post-colonial critiques of international relations, given that, and I quote here from Maria's work, the discipline has tended to ignore Eastern European insights and the validity of their experiences. Her keynote lecture on NATO's new front, Ali Deterrence Goes East, is part and parcel of the critical perspectives on NATO workshop that Dr. Catherine Wright and I are organizing in a politics department. This two-day workshop is sponsored by the British Academy, by the British International Studies Association, by the Military War and Security Research Group, and more widely by the Politics Department of Newcastle University. This morning, we've welcomed an international body of scholars and practitioners interested in assessing the Alliance's role in international politics, of course, given the geopolitical changes and the geopolitical consequences provoked by Russia's war on Ukraine. Given Maria's research expertise, her extensive involvement in policy circles, we thought it would be a fantastic opportunity to open her lecture to staff and students alike. Maria will talk for about 40 minutes and then we will open the floor for questions uh, and discussion. And without further ado, Maria, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Sorana. Thank you, and um, hello, everyone who I haven't yet seen at the workshop uh, during the day. I'm very grateful um, and really uh, honored for this uh, thrilling invitation and the opportunity to, to share some of the uh, early results of my uh, research project that uh, Sorana mentioned, Ritual Deterrence. And it's it's really a treat to do that with a you know circle of critical NATO buffs, which is not a terribly large circle. So so it's it's also very nice for me personally to do it in the great city of Newcastle, which I haven't uh, visited visited before. And uh, that, as I hear, never stands still, which I guess is a is a, a fitting metaphor for NATO as well. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do in my talk is to sort of chronicle how NATO's deterrence is now going east and what this really means for the Allies new and old and of course what this also might mean for the emerging security order uh, in Europe against the backdrop of course of, uh, of revisionist Russia and its ongoing war in Ukraine. But I like also <laughs> at the end, touch upon a methodological point, and of course, to do that in an inevitably personal context. 
And that is briefly how one can actually remain critical uh, in one's analysis of the North Atlantic Alliance when security has once again become really existential. At least it has in my uh, country's case. So I also want to, whilst drawing on this first phase of fieldwork of my ritual deterrence projects, offer some autoethnographic reflections of um, an Estonian critical security studies scholar who is actively witnessing how allied deterrence is being built on my doorstep. But let me start from the beginning then. Going east is something that has been a prominent feature of NATO's post Cold War history. You all know the story. Czech Republic, Hungary and Poland joined in uh, 1999. The Baltic states, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, Slovenia uh, followed course in 2004. And then Albania, Croatia in 2009, Montenegro in 2017, North Macedonia in 2020. And, you know, who knows, maybe the list will continue. Uh, so we have this situation where, you know, there was this promise that was allegedly given to the USSR during the German unification debates uh, that NATO would move not one inch to the east. And I take my chances. Is this green thing the highlighter? It's not. It doesn't matter. You can obviously see what I'm pointing at, right? So this is the book Mary Elisa Roth uh, wrote, uh, sort of starting from this very phrase, which is a contested promise uh, among uh, international historians and something that has already produced a little sort of sub-literature of its own. But that was allegedly the promise. And now we are in the situation where NATO's Madrid summit declaration of last June, June 2022, uh, has this proclamation in it to defend every inch of allied territory at all times, which is, of course, the alliance's response to, to Russia's war against Ukraine. And in particular, um, uh, the setting up of NATO's enhanced forward presence in Poland and the Baltic states, I would suggest, offers us this critical case to actually examine how understandings of extended or allied deterrence are currently changing or are also sort of easing us into this post post Cold War era, if you will. So in a nutshell, I would say that this enhanced forward presence or EFP for a shorthand is a story of negotiating the strategic and symbolic logics of modern extended deterrence. It's also the material enactment of a credible allied solidarity pledge in the exposed eastern flank, and it is the navigation of the alliance's security dilemma in relation to Russia while buttressing the eastern allies' physical and NATO's own ontological security. And of course, it's in broader terms, if we think of it, you know, how NATO in the post-Cold War era has, has uh, you know, walked the line from alliance to a security community and back to the alliance again. It's uh, a variation on this old adage of plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. We are now in a situation uh, where the Alliance's 2022 strategic concept identifies the Russian Federation as the most significant and direct threat to Allied security and to peace and stability in the Euro-Atlantic area, which is obviously in quite a striking contrast to NATO's 2010 strategic concept, which aimed for a true strategic partnership with Russia. But of course, for the critics, uh, NATO's extension into the East European space is the very thing that is to blame uh, for the predicament we are currently in, as it has allegedly contributed to the current situation and NATO's consequent renaissance as a military alliance, who again has to, you know, uh, invest into deterring its historical bête noir uh, that has again turned its modern day challenger. So skeptics such as, for instance, Joshua Schifrinson warn of the resulting pressure on the United States, and I quote him in a recent book on NATO enlargement, where he says, 
the US is now uh, pressed to defend several Eastern European states of questionable strategic value and of minimal long-term importance. But let's keep in mind that moving this North Atlantic Alliance's deterrence and defense establishment eastwards in the military sense of the word is something that is actually a very recent phenomenon. With the introduction of these compact allied battle groups in Poland and the Baltic states only in 2017, <coughs> and, and then this 2022 decision, or perhaps more a little bit like an aspiration or proclamation, to buttress the alliance's force posture in the eastern flank from an earlier tripwire setup to a more robust forward defense stance. So again, I'd say that these debates that we are currently very much in the midst of over what is then the optimal allied deterrence on NATO's new eastern front, they illustrate this quandary of uh, reconciling the ontological security needs of a fundamentally defensive alliance and by that I mean the security of the subjective sense of who one is, which enables and motivates action and choice. So how do or how does NATO reconcile its ontological security needs with the demands of delivering on uh, its physical security promise to all member states? And hence, we can investigate, I would say, this ongoing substantiation of the Allied deterrence and defense pledge in NATO's northeastern flank as an instance of NATO's grappling with a security dilemma sensibility of its historical opponent, while it is navigating its own concerns over Allied entrapment by more exposed member states vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So by this security dilemma sensibility, uh, I mean, of course, the notion in the sense of Ken Booth and, and Nicholas Wheeler, who, who have used this term or coined this term. So it's basically uh, the responsiveness uh, to uh, uh, the potential complexity of the military intentions of others, which also refers to the ability to understand the role fear might play in their attitudes and behavior including the role that one's own actions may play in producing that fear. So basically, it's it's about the fundamental ability to put yourself into the other's shoes, to, to simplify. But of course, we can also say that, that uh, this belated extension of NATO's extended deterrence apparatus to its eastern fringes also unfolds as a story of the alliance's demonstration of more security dilemma sensibility towards Russia throughout the post-Cold War period, then towards its own Eastern member states, uh, security political concerns um, until uh, at least Russia's annexation of Crimea and its intervention in Eastern Ukraine in 2014. But that being said, deterrence, of course, is still something that has historically been a core trait of NATO's rationale and NATO's self-identity. So when we look at this case of NATO reinventing, rediscovering its deterrence roots, so to speak, or self, uh, and reinvigorating the old templates, um, it's also, in a way, an exercise of uh, reinventing the whole business of conventional deterrence for the time when it was actually thought, this is not something we will need anymore in Europe. It's not any more relevant. And uh, of course, when we look at these decisions that have been taken, you know, uh, as a response to, to Russia's uh, sort of open aggressiveness, at least since 2014, if we start counting from there, if we look at the decisions of the Warsaw Summit of 2016 to set up the battle groups uh, in, in Poland and the Baltic states, and then onwards, they, of course, go fundamentally against the grain of the strategic and military direction that the alliance had actually taken in the post-Cold War era, with its focus on out-of-area operations and expeditionary counter-terrorism, counter-insurgency tasks, which was a very different profile that was being built. Meanwhile, Russia, actually, from well, maybe not from you know 1991, 
but but from uh, some point onwards continue to nurture its preponderance of conventional forces in Eastern Europe and also became increasingly vocal uh, about its status concerns in international politics. So the sort of motif of reading or misreading Russia is something that uh, is a very interesting and very predominant aspect that keeps popping up in these conversations that I that I have as part of my fieldwork and I will bring you some examples uh, in uh, in due course but okay so we can learn something about you know what is now happening to the modern allied deterrence right via this case that is my point number one but I think this case of enhanced forward presence or NATO's reinvention of conventional uh, deterrence on the eastern flank also um, allows us to see much more than just uh, you know the, the the deterrence bit i think at the theoretical level this return of nato to and reinvention of its conventional deterrence credentials demonstrates the relevance of extending the insights from ritual theory to deterrence theory in international relations and this deterrence theory of international relations, as many of you well know, is already a pretty broad church and busy church. I mean, one of its most canonical classics, Thomas Schelling, described deterrence theory as, and I quote him, a mixture of game theory, organization theory, communication theory, theory of evidence, theory of choice, and theory of collective decision. So to make this long list even longer, I would uh, argue that, uh, we would do well to look further into the body of ritual scholarship and to see uh, what it helps us to understand about some of the core questions that keep uh, sort of puzzling and troubling uh, deterrence, uh, both scholarship and practice, you could say. So these are the core questions. And I would argue that ritualization is particularly central in the practice of extended deterrence and hence we need to you know understand it and take it seriously to also advance the understanding of the core problems in deterrence theory such as how do we actually convey credible intentions how do we determine the credibility of deterrent threats and and promises and commitments and thereby, of course, we are also better able to enhance uh, the related contextual knowledge for deterrence practitioners. Now, what do I mean by this ritualization? I conceptualize it here as a strategy of re-enchantment of political interactions, uh, the success of which is dependent on the social magic of the performative. So ritual action is something that serves to charge the salient interactions with the force of credibility and authority. It entails a mixture of conventionalization, routinization, customization or traditionalization. It entails a certain set of rules, you know, outline of an acceptable conduct. It entails oftentimes allusions to special symbols which are particularly charged, which, for instance, make for a particularly strong deterrent signal <laughs> as intersubjectively defined. For instance, in the Baltic context, what you often hear, of course, is that, well, I mean, we are particularly happy for our setup of, um, uh, of um, uh, enhanced forward presence allied battle group because we have two nuclear powers as part of this. Um, or, you know, we would really like the Americans, we would really like more Americans because they, you know, have more, supposedly more weight uh, as a, you know, no matter how small numerically uh, their presence would be, right? So what, that's the sort of theoretical point. What then transpires from NATO's deterrences going east methodologically, is I would suggest the importance of actually studying deterrence politics and practice as it unfolds in a concrete context. So I think this, this very case underscores the imperative of studying very closely how deterrence policies and strategies are, and practices are made to count as deterrence in a political sense of the word. So, you know, studying deterrence making 
in practice is very much the sort of gist of uh, of my project and of course the sort of trajectory of the case tells us a story of NATO's physical presence on the alliance's eastern flank as having evolved from barely existent to then symbolic and now on to something militarily more tangible over the last decade. But again, you know, in conceptual terms, I think when we examine enhanced forward presence through a ritual lens, we see how intertwined security practices, deterrence making and alliance making really are. And one is constantly reminded of the observation, at least, you know, the one being me in that case, when I look uh, at, uh, at, at the case, you know, uh, both through through written materials and through the uh, sort of in-person engagements, I'm reminded of this observation that Bradley Klein, an early post-structuralist scholar and critic of uh, Cold War deterrence, uh, who noted at the end of the Cold War that, and I quote him, NATO's success was due not to having deterred Soviet aggression, nor to having successfully managed repeated crises among its allies, but to having produced those various allies in the first place. So this is, you know, what is what is really happening. So I went on um, Monday, actually, I was in Estonia observing this largest, you know, allied military exercise that happens in Estonia. It's called Spring Storm. And then somewhere in the middle of the woods, there was this um, commander of the American visiting contingent. And, you know, he would just offhandedly give me the quote, which is like as if taken from, you know, Turkemian account of what rituals do in terms of solidarity building and, and how ritual practice in a way works, right? So so uh, I stupidly left it on my phone, but it was it went something like, you know, uh, you gotta bring them together. You gotta show, make them work together. And uh, I bring them here to the Estonian woods to show what NATO is talking about his soldiers in terms of again, you know, building the allied bonds and 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 building this sort of um, what is known in the NATO lingo as uh, allied togetherness and uh, and unity, right? So what is also happening, of course, with this uh, parallel process of um, allies making or allies shaping and building that happens with, with this reinvention of deterrence is also uh, the probably you know, natural process of uh, the Eastern flank allies security anxieties having become more part of NATO's own mainstream threat assessment. Obviously, it's not seamless or smooth, and there is still a notable practical lag in delivering on this uh, current situation appraisal on NATO's part, you could say. But I think the, the core thing uh, that appears from, uh, before we get into the more granular story of, of, uh, of uh, how deterrence building has unfolded uh, roughly over the past, uh, past decade or so, uh, the core point is that NATO is also uh, reinventing its modern extended deterrence in the eastern flank by mobilizing the renown scripts of the Cold War, but obviously not exactly filling them with the same uh, okay. or with the sort of original uh, content uh, or the content or the numbers that would be on par with the original uh, meaning of, for instance, what forward defense meant in the Cold War days, as it was uh, set up in the central uh, region uh, of NATO. So there is also this element, and this is where the ritualization aspect comes in, that uh, tapping into these renowned scripts, of course, enables the Alliance to also enhance the, the gravitas of its commitment to the defense of the Eastern flank states and supposedly also, uh, you know, sort of enhance the, the deterrent uh, signals. And that happens still against the backdrop of, of uh, you know, the, the Allied military footprint obviously remaining notably lighter in the region compared to NATO setup 
uh, throughout the Cold War, uh, say, you know, in, in Germany. So there is this inventive use of ritual dramatization, you could say, that is there to boost NATO's visibility and NATO's credibility on the ground, which not least also happens via constant um, uh, uh, allusions to the historical analogy of, of the Allied defense of West Berlin when comparing uh, the situation in the Baltic states. So the gist of this effort, this, this effort of the broader project for me, uh, is to, to highlight that, of course, deterrence as an international security practice is much more than just a strategy of war prevention. I mean, it's also not a small feat, of course, to, to be in the business of uh, war prevention, but it is a politically and symbolically loaded means of delineating the boundaries and thresholds that then together define this competitive space between the adversaries. So what is going on here is, is this sort of um, twofold uh, challenge in a way for NATO uh, when it comes its own sort of servicing of its ontological security needs. So on the one hand, returning to a deterrence relationship with its historical enemy furthers its uh, historical sense of self, right? Because allied rearming and routinizing of its deterrence posture, of course, cements the familiar practices of enmity vis-a-vis -vis Russia. But obviously, on the other hand, it also severely complicates it because we can't disregard that, you know, things did not stand still at this post-Cold War period when there was actually sort of genuine attempts uh, or genuine attempts to build some sort of a different kind of relationship, uh, at least periodically. Uh, and these have also left their legacy. And of course, you know, this rearming is again at odds with the alliance's ingrained defensive self identity uh, again. So the idea then is that if we uh, if we take this uh, ritual fabric or the ritual like features of deterrence uh, in general and extended deterrence in particular uh, seriously, seriously, then we also can better appreciate how crucial the effective dynamics are in conveying this credible threat or a credible commitment in the intra-alliance uh, uh, relationships. And again, this is not something that, you know, I just pulled out of my sort of political anthropology uh, affinities uh, had, uh, again, this very hardcore uh, deterrent scholar Thomas Selling early on uh, emphasized the uh, significance of the symbolic dimension of deterrence messaging. For example, he wrote about the representative value, again, of the United States tripwire forces, embodying, quote, the pride, the honor, the reputation of the country. And he underscored explicitly the role of ritual, as well as the role of diplomacy in enhancing or alternatively eroding the implicit commitments that are being made in, in, in signaling deterrence. So, in a nutshell, I think when we study NATO's reinvention of its allied deterrence in the alliance's eastern flank, we, we get this evocative case uh, to, to explore how ritualization actually helps to make deterrence matter on the ground. And of course, we get also a unique sort of lens into the political work deterrence does. Uh, on the other hand. So uh, to tell now briefly the story of uh, how uh, NATO has brought its deterrence and uh, defense edifice to the new member states in Eastern Europe, uh, we can sort of capture it effectively in this sentence, but I'll expand on that a little bit. So initially, we uh, had for quite some years this situation, which was not unlike the situation NATO had, you know, after its uh, creation uh, in, uh, uh, in 1949, which was effectively the idea that, well, Article 5 itself will, so to speak, do it. It will do the deterrence work uh, by default. 
So it's it's uh, something that we can refer to deterrence by alliance. In terms of the practical substantiation, this was the name of the game for, for say, you know, up until the establishment of these compact allied battle groups after the decision was taken in 2016 Warsaw summits. I mean, there was, of course, air policing in the Baltic states. There was some, some, some you know, gradual, you know, minor co-exercising and so on. But, but from the EFP establishment onwards, we can start talking about, as one of my informants put it, deterrence by flag waving, when uh, it was more really about reassuring uh, the exposed and very vulnerable feeling, you know, particularly Baltic allies, and hence, <laughs> with all the effort on, you know, the numbers don't matter. Uh, what really matters is the allied unity and togetherness, and this is what we are here to signal, and and this is the signal that we expect the challenger to also uh, pick up, right? Uh, and then uh, again, uh, this was something that was declared or perceived to be somewhat uh, uh, bankrupt, particularly when uh, also some, um, some uh, statements were being made uh, about uh, what it actually would mean to operate on the uh, sort of liberation war logic or, or, you know, what if NATO actually had to deliver on what it had built up, which is deterrence by punishment, uh, meaning that, you know, uh, considering the Baltic states, I don't have the map in here, but for those of you, most of you probably can, can envision it. I mean, it's, uh, it's something that you can easily put also paste on the map of Ukraine and see what sort of a strategic depth problem is there and what sort of a, a time, uh, Time deficiency issue is that when it comes to uh, allied reinforcements arriving, uh, so that you would not have to liberate, but you would actually start fighting from from uh, from uh, you know, point one, so to speak. So you know, hence also one could say that uh, in very fundamental ways, you know, very disturbing uh, revelations and news about Russia's way of warfare in Ukraine, not least Butcher. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, in sort of public uh, case making sense, helped the Baltic case to start convincing the alliance that that uh, the model needs to change more towards the deterrence by denial type of a thing. So, if you actually want to keep true to the promise of of uh, defending every inch, then you have to start defending forward. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't um, it doesn't uh, deliver, or it's not convincing. So fundamentally, one could say that this conventional force posture of NATO in the post Cold War age has been dictated by Russia's aggressive actions in its self proclaimed near abroad. Just quite alike, actually, how the alliance's conventional force posture originally took shape in response to an external event, which was the Korean War back in the day. So uh, it was really only after Russia's annexation of Crimea and the invasion of Eastern Ukraine in 2014, when NATO first uh, made uh, this, this uh, you know, basic promise more substantial uh, in the region, which had been avoided until this time out of the fear of thus alienating or, or provoking Russia. And as some... Uh, all the colleagues who worked at the NATO headquarters at the time uh, have also frustratedly expressed. I mean, there was this major, major sort of mismatch or, or misunderstanding. As one of them said, you know, NATO was caught pants down about Russia's actions, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Crimea. So it was something entirely unexpected. NATO was entirely unprepared or something of the kind. So again, to follow on with this metaphor, we could say that, well, pants have been pulled up and you could also say that maybe NATO is even pulling its socks up now uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to, to taking this, this issue uh, more seriously. 
I think I will save you from, from you know, listing all the detailed steps that happened post Crimea. I mean, these are well, you know, available in the public space. I guess what is maybe worth emphasizing here is how this uh, compact EFP, which is an unprecedented thing in the region, um, in, you know, political and military terms by, by all means, how it was really celebrated as the biggest uh, in reinforcement of allied collective defense in a generation. And how, in a way, again, there was this certain um, uh, gap between, you know, what actually amounted to this biggest reinforcement. And because we are really talking about, you know, roughly 1,000, uh, 1,400 contingents in each, uh, each uh, of the eastern flank countries in manpower. Uh, and again, you know, it's, it really depends on what your point of comparison is, right? But obviously, you know, regardless of these forces being combat ready and training, you know, to be combat ready, they were not exactly heavyweight and, and most military analysts did not buy that this tripwire would actually be uh, a particularly efficient <coughs> deterrent in military uh, terms uh, when it came to, you know, the credible denial of, say, Russia's land grab. I mean, this would have been difficult to, to avoid. So that was in the beginning, again, inevitably against this sort of, uh, you know, backstory or the history thus far, NATO's uh, sort of tripwire combined with a rapid reinforcement strategy, there was this sense of reactiveness or, or incrementality to it in the beginning. And, and also, you know, many, many military analysts would say that there was definitely an insufficient addressing of Russia's time, space and, and also mass advantages uh, in the region. Now, as I said, this, of course, uh, changed very soon, I mean, already started to, you know, be very actively questioned at the end of 2021. Let's not forget that most, or, you know, at least the, a big bulk of these ultimatums that Russia served to NATO before the invasion uh, were not just or only about Ukraine, but actually pertain to, you know, what NATO's boundaries should look like and where it should go back to. And uh, the suggested you know, place NATO should uh, go back to was the place that uh, uh, froze time in 1997, which, you know, as the, as the list of Eastern enlargements uh, dates would tell you, would not include a single Eastern European state. So we got these new, you know, vocal uh, spokespersons, of course, that also media for, you know, good and obvious reasons would, would uh, very much uh, uh, embrace uh, very warmly. So I, I put, you know, these, these two important quotes by Estonia's prime minister up there, which uh, I think have been a very important actually part of this discursive sequence or the also the shift that uh, that uh, was you know prepared uh, and paved the way in many ways to the madrid summit decisions so kaya gallas uh, so to speak revealed uh, nato's uh, you know uh, liberation war by punishment inevitability under the you know current force poster circumstances obviously you know as a sort of tactical move to put pressure uh, before um, uh, the or you know in the course of the preparations of the forthcoming uh, decisions that nato had to take and of course the new strategic concept and so on and so forth the other quote, I think, is simply a very beautiful illustration to this um, uh, weight that, uh, you know, differentiated weight that is allocated politically uh, to, to different flags, so to speak, right? And, uh, and you know, it's very simply put, but also it, it captivates much of the if not so publicly expressed, but much of this sort of, you know, in private conversations expressed spirit uh, when you talk uh, to people who are um, actually, you know, doing uh, and shaping uh, these policies. So what happened then was, of course, also the conscious re-invocation by the Baltic elites of this Cold War era deterrent script of a more substantial combat-ready forward defense. 
So it sort of very um, willfully taps into this into this uh, Cold War era counterpart. But of course, again, you know, when I talk to people, one thing is to say that, well, you know, the concept has not changed. The concept is still tripwire, which is, for instance, what the British um, EFP in Estonia uh, battle group commander told me. Whereas I think the Baltic elites themselves at least want to believe that it will be something that you know will grow further over time and 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 you know there will be further promises on this you know from a battalion sized battle groups to to actually brigade sized and more heavy equipment and more serious exercises and what so you know it's it's on the one hand, obviously, these things take time, they don't happen overnight, and it's not to deny that regardless of these uh, beautiful overstatements that always come with NATO big gatherings, the points of tension have magically disappeared. I mean, they are still obviously there, and it's also not the case that all interests suddenly within the alliance are fundamentally aligned about how harsh or how principled one has to be vis-a-vis vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. But what it certainly, this current ongoing uh, horror of the war has brought home, I think, more broadly to the alliance is, is the high price of deterrence by punishment. And of course, that is, you know, particularly viscerally felt by most, <laughs> most allies uh, themselves. So, <laughs> These ritual allusions to um, Cold War era deterrence playbook and its conventional uh, reference points, such as forward defense, serve to enhance the credibility of the current makeup of the Allied deterrence solution in NATO's eastern flank, which, of course, still, you know, is, is a very much a, a thing in the making. So, so there is some purposeful rhetorical amplification that uh, is going on and that helps to supposedly enhance this supposed and, uh, and sought performative effect of allied deterrence in the Baltic space. But as I said, deterrence making is fundamentally also alliance making. So, you know, it's also about consolidating the allied community, the solidary commitment uh, to each member state security through, you know, these regular training, uh, and exercises, and of course, off duty socializing. So um, maybe, you know, let me just share some, some uh, nice empirical snippets and then I will conclude so that we could also discuss. Um, so obviously, you know, as with any chronology uh, or chronicling effort, we also can ask, you know, why did NATO sort of start reacting in 2014, and why didn't it start openly reacting, for instance, uh, in 2008, right? I mean, in a way, this is still part of the story because this was then when this issue of Baltic defense plans, or as one informant put it, uh, yeah, my colleague said that, you know, they had actually held these plans in their hand, but it must have been a very light, very light uh, luggage to hold, so to speak. So, so basically, this became sort of a public uh, news that, uh, in the context of of uh, Russia Georgia war of two thousand and eight, that there weren't particularly granular contingency plans uh, there uh, at NATO for the defense of the Baltic states. And as one of my informants told me. It was then when various Baltic leaders acknowledged that our window will soon close again. For a moment, Russia has shown its colors. We need to now get us covered within this window of opportunity. So the assumption at the time was that the West does not understand. Let's push through as much as possible there and then. But then came 2014, a new shock. Yet the local officials have always been highly conscious of the fact that should they raise the alarm too high at the time when Russia was not actively proving what it was like, I promise there was a little bit more colorful wording actually, they would be regarded as hysteric bolts yet again, bolts yet again, end of quote. So that was this idea that, yes, NATO was fundamentally out of touch and this was very, very sort of, uh, 
exquisite balancing exercise not to also overdo it with the demands. So one of the, uh, the uh, interviewees who worked at SHAPE at the time told me how, how uh, uh, there was a request for a contingency plan from NATO headquarters issued to SHAPE under the political guideline of do not escalate. Uh, when Russia's little green men were already in Crimea. I mean, that is already really sort of telling in the context of uh, being in touch with the reality, I guess. So that, there is this sort of sense that, yes, there was active denialism about uh, Russia for quite some time. And of course, also the, the clinging to the hope of the dialogue, um, which... Uh, which was again something that uh, has now become a bit changed so that as another Baltic representative at NATO told me, people who did not listen to us before have now started to do so. And hence, you know, reactivating this, uh, this muscle memory and also starting to build something new so that as, uh, as the uh, NATO uh, Battle Group Estonia commander, uh, the British brigadier, uh, put it in an interview. Now it's a normal thing for the Allies to come to Estonia, um, which obviously was a little bit more exotic uh, back in uh, in 2017. So to wrap up this, sorry, uh, NATO's physical presence on the alliance's eastern flank has, as I said, evolved from something that was very barely existent to you know, something that was mostly politically symbolic and something that is now aiming to be militarily more tangible. And this has happened in a pretty, pretty short uh, time frame, actually, the last two phases, anyhow. So we see this mobilization of these old scripts uh, but of course, also we see the sort of distance between these scripts and, and where we actually practically get are when it comes to the substantiation, for instance, of this forward defense uh, posture. So meanwhile, NATO is making very inventive use of ritual dramatization to boost its, its uh, believability on the ground. And again, uh, if I may reiterate these, these points that I think sort of transpire from, from this case are um, the imperative of looking really closely at uh, how uh, deterrents are made to count as deterrents and what are their intended effects, but also what are their unintended effects uh, in practice. And conceptually then, I believe that uh, with a ritual uh, equipment, so to speak, or a lens, or however you want to call it, sensibility, perhaps, uh, we can see um, how, you know, deterrent stars, actually, it's political work, and some of these, these things that uh, traditional or rational deterrence theory has, has left us a little bit in the limbo about. And I promised that I would have personal reflections, I'll, I'll end on that. So eventually, because this is also a work in progress, just as EFP is a work in progress. I mean, it's I'm at the sort of in the middle of my first year of the project, so it's not terribly uh, advanced yet. But in the eventual monograph, I would in a way like to sort of be inspired by this book that uh, memory sociologist uh, Sarah Gensberg uh, wrote uh, about the commemoration practices, very micro practices that unfolded post Bataclan in her Paris neighborhood. And she did this very thick study over a year. I mean, I probably can't, you know, quite mimic the micro level of it, but I think in the sort of gist or spirit, uh, how memory on her doorstep, and in my case, how deterrence on my doorstep have uh, have been uh, sort of built up. So it's in that sense, obviously, a personal personal project uh, as well. And uh, and I threw out this question of, you know, obviously I struggle with it all the time. And I think this is a good format to discuss it, particularly good format to discuss it. How does one keep the critical edge when you have to 
I mean, when you you know sense also the enormity of the of the um, sort of existential uh, challenge that is that is currently there, and I don't yet have an answer to that question, but I hope maybe I have a little bit uh, more satisfactory an answer by the end of the project, by the end of the war, at least. Thank you. <laughs>